the elementary and secondary education relief funding, and that is the emergency relief funding. We have a FY23 performance report that was released by the US Department of Ed about three weeks ago. And we have been working as a team to populate the information and convert that request to GEMS. So today we really wanted to walk through each of the components of the performance report, share some resources with you, and then um, identify timelines and where all of the information is going to live. We hope to have the GEMS application available by the end of this week, but in the interim, we wanted to be sure that you folks had the information so that you can get started. Uh, th thank you, Shelley. Uh, I'm Karen Kuziak, and I'll be reading many of the reports that, that you send in. I'm the uh, coordinator of the uh, ARP ESSER this time. Um, it's going to be a long slide presentation, so I think I'll just tell you that um, these are required reports. Uh, the state or the SEA has to report on uh, in great detail about how we've been spending our money. And the subgrantees or the SAUs under 34 CFR 76.722 also have a substantial reporting requirement this year, and it's by statute. And as Karen alluded to, we do have a fair amount of material to go through. So we do encourage you to put your questions in the chat box. We will get to as many as possible. We are recording this webinar and this will be available on our website. And we will also create a document of all the questions that we receive in the chat box to be able to put on our website. So a few things to kind of keep in mind is the collection document from the US Department of Ed is a publicly available document. So this slide is hyperlinked to that public document. It's essentially off of the Education Stabilization Fund Transparency Portal. So if you've been to that transparency portal to see spending or usage across our nation, that is also the location you will find this public uh, document for the SEA, which is the State Education Agency collection form. As we said on the onset of this hour, uh, the report is only for FY23, so State Fiscal Year FY23. That is July 1st of 2022 through June 30th of 2023. So as you see, we are already in well established in FY24 and have been in FY24 for a number of months. So you're really thinking about those expense school year expenses of 22, 23, and really want to define what you submitted for invoices for reimbursement, because those are the only expenses that you're going to report on in this fiscal report. The FY23 ESER performance report is going to be due on April 14th, 2024. That is the Friday before April break. As we mentioned, we know that that provides you roughly two months to pull together this information, which is why we're hosting this office hour so we can get as much information out to you while we continue to refine the application, The excuse me, the performance report that will be available on GEMS. Again, all of the emergency relief funding items is, um, is on GEMS. Again, that's a platform that only the emergency relief funds um, has within GEMS. April 14th, 2024, is a Sunday, and that is the Sunday before April break. And we we will be checking reports on Monday. So what happens after that due date is we correlate all of the data and we transfer it to all of the Excel spreadsheets that the US Department of Ed has um, provided. So when we get to work Monday morning, we are going to start that collection. 
The, um, I'm responding to a chat question. I'm sorry, Shelley. Uh, the Friday before break meant before February break, the um, report should be available on GEM to start populating. So we did we did um, have some resources that we have made available off of our website. So we created a whole brand new web page on our website. Karen was able to pull together some information. She has provided you with a blank copy of the FY23 ESA performance report. That copy is both available in a Word document and a PDF. So if you are working collectively over the district, you may have certain sections that are easier for particular roles or individuals to collect the information. And that's why we provided the Word document. And then we are also hosting an open no agenda sort of help office hour every Wednesday at 11 starting the Wednesday after February break, so February 28th. And um, colleagues, some of you who are not sharing your screen or, or driving the slides or presenting material, if you don't mind throwing a few of those links in the chat box, thank you so much, Chair Terry put the open office hours. So if you register for uh, that link, using that link, you will be registered for every single Wednesday. We will have at least one member of our team available in that link and that um, session from 11 to 12 noon. And if you happen to have a conflict and you can't join us at 11 o'clock, you can join us at 1134 and there will be somebody there to respond to your questions. Like I said, we will have at least one member of our team on that Zoom open no agenda help session every single Wednesday between Wednesday, February 28th through the week that it is due before April break. One thing that we did last year that we had positive feedback that we also did for this year is we are going to pre-populate your financial data. So based on your requests for reimbursement between in these dates for this FY23 fiscal year, you will see that X number of dollars was used of CARES funding or X number of dollars was reimbursed for CARESA funding. Those numbers, those that financial data will be pre-populated in every single individual performance report. Slide four, great, thank you. Uh, someone asked if the slides will be in the chat. We're, we're not able to put them in the chat right now. Um, we can get them posted on our website pretty quickly and then send you the URL for the slides. So there are, as requested, we have highlighted both in this little table of contents as well as in some of our slides that are coming up, the new sections that are required with greater detail this year compared to other years. So the accurate SEA reporting remains essential to providing the public with timely insight into how ESSER funds have been used by the SEA and the LEAs to support students. And you know that um, you know, if you read any of the papers or, or, or dig into this, you know that there is a lot of interest in how the ESSER funds are being used. So um, you remember last year, we previewed some of the additional information, the new information that's gonna be required this year. So we hope this isn't a big surprise to you, but we, we also realize that there's a lot of reporting that's gonna be required this year in the year four uh, ESSER ARP collection. And we'll be going through each one of these uh, red sections uh, as we continue. So with any federal obligation, they are required to do a paperwork burden statement. So we've pulled this burden statement directly from the publicly available uh, data collection form. We wanted to draw your attention to the time that the US Department of Ed has indicated will be needed to complete this data collection. So you can see here that we've highlighted 140 hours per LEA response. That is really the time in which the US Department of Ed has 
calculated and estimated, it will take one LEA to submit the data collection form, also known as the FY22, uh, excuse me, FY23 performance report. Right, and I want to highlight, I can see Mr. Moore in there kind of spinning his phone around, uh, highlight that it's not one person that's going to be spending 140 hours, but it's uh, collectively, um, you know, you're going to have to be uh, asking your program people, the person who's running your summer program, as well as your financial people, um, information in order to fill this out. So this slide um, is where you will find, this just highlights where you will find the report in our gen portal system. So you're gonna look under ESSER performance report, other years you've seen phase one, phase two, this is phase three. And uh, the account for the ESSER and the uh, federal grant reimbursement system will grant access to the performance report. So what we wanted to do in the next few slides is really walk through each of the sections and we will determine um, some new sections, some new questions, as well as how the information is collected and maintained within the GEMS platform. I do see Don's question about, so if this is times five because there's five schools, that, that is not directly correlated with the estimate in my opinion, because you really determined a financial agent and the financial agent is taking on the responsibility. Because you're collecting data from five different schools, there may be potential of an additional level of work and time, but it, in my personal opinion, without an educated guess, um, I would say that it would not be exactly 140 hours times five. Mike, I was just asking that because um, the only one that was all together as one was um, SR1. And then the other ones are all separate in each of five GEMS accounts. So that's why I was asking that question. Okay, I'll be, I'll stop now. No, but, but you, you make a great point, right? So the work associated with one funding source is going to be smaller than the work associated with the other two funding sources because of the way it was structured. Yeah. So there is going to be an additional time commitment on those two additional those two um, other funding sources. But I'm not sure it's going to be directly 140. But yes, you are going to have five different reports to to complete. Oh, right. And I'm sitting here thinking, realizing now that some of you are business managers or applicant coordinators for several AOS districts, separate schools. So yes, that, that certainly will add up. Yeah. So there are 11 parts to this performance report for FY23. And each part represents information that we directly pulled from the SEA data collection form that the U.S. Department of Ed provided to us. We pulled out all of the questions that are associated with LEAs and we've put them forth in this performance report to collect to you, to collect from you so that we can report to the U.S. Department of Ed. One thing that I will note is we tried to put a lot of logic and um, calculations on the back end of GEMS to highlight any miscalculations or information that doesn't align over the different financial matters in particular. So I am encouraging you to do the pages in the chronological order that they're established on the landing page in GEMS. At times, you may walk through them and take a look at them, but essentially that part two that financial matter feeds into other pages that does a check to be sure that the reporting of the financials aligns with something that has previously been reported within the performance report. So thinking about how that's going to be structured and how you might use the blank PDF or Word document will be extremely important at each local level because I think the Word document and the PDF is gonna be much more helpful to sort of do that preliminary co collection before inputting it in GEMS. As many of you know, 
all of the data needs to be entered in the data entry side of the house. Um, and data is the top left of the blue bar. And once you have a check mark on all of these parts, the uh, applicant, the performance report would be ready for submission. As you can see, this is our test site, and um, we have not completed every single page on the test site, which is why there's not a check mark to the left of each of the sections. But once you have a check mark on each of the sections, you will be able to uh, submit the FY23 performance report. And thanks, folks. We have people in the audience answering some of the questions. So thank you for sharing the the uh, links to the Word document and the PDF. Uh, so here's here's how uh, you're going to. First of all, you have to make sure that the the setup for the performance report is accurate. I draw your attention to having accurate DUNS numbers and UEI numbers. I think we addressed that last year, and and we all should. You all should have your US. Uh, UEI number accurately, but make sure that all the information in the setup page is correct because uh, the performance report cover sheet is populated by the setup information. And as Karen said, the setup page populates the cover sheet and the cover sheet, what happens upon submission is it will generate an email from GEMS directly to the superintendent so that the superintendent can review and certify the information in the performance report. So I'm gonna go back one slide. In, in this top area, there's a superintendent and an email. This is the email that is used to send that certification. So this email up top is not for our ESER applicant coordinators. It is for the superintendent to be sure that the cover sheet and this report gets emailed to the appropriate individual. Because what happens is the email is sent to the superintendent and there's a specific URL, username and password right embedded in that email generated from GEMS. And that's the information that your superintendent will utilize to um, certify and review the performance report. And I know that there's a, a few questions in the chat box. Thanks team for monitoring that and responding. Right, and I think this will answer your question, Diana. Um, for fiscal data, we're looking at the billing date. The US Department of Education has no idea what happened in your billing period because you have not communicated that to us. So you're going to be reporting only the expenditures that have dates that you invoiced the, you, uh, the main Department of Education that come within the dates of the performance period. So we're looking at the yellow section, the billing date, not the billing period. That was that came up often last year, and we direct you right to check those dates in that first call the date column that's highlighted in yellow. If those dates fall between the dates of this performance period as fiscal year 23, then it is included in the report. The only time it might not be is if one of those dates is very, very close to the uh, end of the reporting period. And if your invoice had not yet been processed, then we might, might not have been able to pull that data to pre-populate. So you're, you're, you will look to see that the totals of the billing periods that you, billing dates rather, um, add up to what we've pre-populated in your particular report. We will walk through that on this next slide a little bit more. Um, so as you can see on the top left, this is a screenshot directly from the FY23 performance report. I highlighted the number in red just to try to keep things calculated and aligned, but your number will be highlighted in blue in the performance report. 
So on every expenditure page, you will see some narrative with a highlighted number. That is the number in which we have generated and pre-populated based on your invoice submissions. Again, as Karen said, we are looking at the billing date and the billing date must be in the performance report period. So July 1st of 22 through June 30th of 23. And essentially all of your expenses for that funding source, because we break apart CARES, Carissa, and ARP, ESER 1, ESER 2, and ESER 3, because we need to determine on three different reports to the US Department of Ed, how much was utilized in that fiscal year. So when you're looking in the federal grant reimbursement system, which is also where you can find your vendor code for that cover page and the uh, setup page, you will see that you have a billing date for every single invoice and that's listed on every single invoice, but you will also see collectively all of the invoices that you've submitted for each of the funding sources. Again, we're looking at the date in which the reimbursement was requested and you received it, not the date in which the expenses occurred at the local level, because we don't have the ability to know how much has occurred at the local level until you have requested a reimbursement. And then we request that reimbursement from the U.S. Department of Ed. So the U.S. Department of Ed is only aware of those activities when our reimbursement request is submitted. I know Karen alluded to sort of the dates that are associated with either the early onset of the fiscal year or the late onset of the fiscal year. So if you're having some calculation misalignment, there's potentially an opportunity for invoice number four to have only been provided to you after July 1st. And those are things that we're gonna want to walk through, depending on if that invoice was returned multiple times and when it was submitted. So those are things that you wanna kind of check, um, check and balances before you reach out to us. But if you have difficulties sort of making that connection, join us, particularly on a Wednesday that we have an open office hour, we'll walk through it or send Karen or I an email and we will definitely support every single district who might have questions or concerns. Right. Okay. You just answered the question in the chat about who to contact if things look wonky on, I think that was the term used on your side. Yeah. So. And, uh, oh, sorry, Karen. And on our, our FY23 performance report webpage, there is contact information at the bottom of the page for any outreach. Okay, so we're moving on to part two, and they're going to be of the report. Remember, there are 11 parts. This is part two. Um, these expenditure categories should be familiar. They're the same categories that you used last year. So addressing physical health and safety, meeting students' academic, social, emotional, and other needs, excluding mental health supports. And this is the one place that you're uh, teasing apart what is social, emotional, other needs, and what is mental health supports, because mental health supports is its own category. And if you, <laughs> you determine which goes where, the U.S. Department of Ed has provided a definition for the purpose of this report about what they consider social, emotional learning and mental health, and it's, it's right there. Uh, and then the last category, major category of expenditures are operational continuity and other uses. And as I said, but here we state it in the slide, note that these are self-selected and you can be the person who decides as long as you can support the certain cost is addressing physical health and safety versus operational continuity, for example. So uh, we there are there was published an ESSER FAQ, and if you need to refer to that, we have linked linked it there. That's a uh, document put together by the U.S. Department of Ed. So I know there was a question in the chat box, and this slide is really going to walk through um, sort of the premises of that question. As I mentioned, your pre-populated reimbursement request total for each of the funding sources is going to be 
highlighted in blue. Here it's highlighted in a red box. And this is related to CARES. So CARES ESER 1. So what this means is there was, again, this is our test site, but there was $7,890 that were requested in reimbursements anywhere in between July 1st of 2022 through December 30th of 2022, because again, this is CARES and that funding source expired. So thinking about what that means for each funding source, the only difference in, in quote unquote dates that you potentially may see at the local level is CARES funding expired after December 30th of 2022. So you will not have any expenses or reimbursements after that date. And you potentially may have already drawn down all of your funds prior to July 1st of 2022. And that would all be denoted here in the pre-populated amount that we've provided to every district. Karen highlighted the four categories. And what happens is each of these category, each of these categories is uh, totaled because that total then transitions into other pages and other uh, sections within the performance report, which is why we're encouraging you to complete it in chronological order that is on the landing page. What we're highlighting here is the pre-populated number in the top left must be equal to the total CARES expenses down below in the bottom right of the box. So as you can see, our test site has an error message, which we've We've cut off, but you can see the top of the error message right at the bottom of that screenshot. So this performance report would not be able to be submitted because that is a logic. That is a check that will throw an error in the system and alert you to the fact that the bottom number, the total of all four categories is not equivalent or equal to the amount that you requested reimbursement for. Again, these are self-reported and self-identified categories. So it will be extremely important for the local level to keep documentation ex identifying which expenses fell into health and safety, which expenses fell into meeting student academic needs. Okay. Um... And continuing with another section of part two, uh, we recall from last time that salaries and benefits are going to be reported separately, even though when you seek reimbursement, we, you can, or when you applied in your application, you had them uh, together. U.S. Department of Ed is asking for them separately, and there will be an error message this year if, uh, if there's a salary without benefits. So keep that in mind. Certainly, if you have a contracted service, that's that's different. Uh, if you're, you know, if you've hired some personnel through contracted service, that's different. But if they're salary, there should be benefits. And the sum, keep this in mind, the sum of all the salaries and benefits for each of the programs will be used to populate an upcoming section on hiring and retention. And now we're getting into, you know, additional reporting for this particular year. Um, they're, they're, the U.S. Department of Ed is looking specifically at certain kinds of positions. So, um Make sure that is accurate because it's going to be pre-populating -pop, pre uh, following section. And the total of each expenditure category will need to match the totals in section B by activity. So CARES ESER 1 and CARISA ESER 2 will only have one column for expenditures. But as everyone knows, ARP has a statutory requirement to reserve at a minimum 20% of your allocation to expend on learning loss initiatives and activities. So when we move to part two, ARP ESER three expenditures, you will see that the page has an additional column and that additional column is to provide you with the opportunity to report the amount that was expended on the reservation projects as they're denoted in the application and the amount of expenses that were um, utilized for the remaining projects. 
Again, it's the same four categories. So health and safety, meeting student needs, mental health and operation. However, it's really thinking about what were the interventions we identified to support the learning loss and the gap created by the pandemic. How much money was spent in those categories for learning loss? The difference in this chart is down below, it is the sum of the two columns that must be equal to the amount that's pre-populated in the top left. So again, all of these are, are self-identified and self-reported. So keeping documentation about how that was those dollar values were determined is going to be important for the, for the local level to have documentation. Okay, so we're just uh, showing you that last year we gave you a preview of what was going to be new for this year. So you might remember this. this is, again, we're, we're trying to show you that this shouldn't be a surprise. And look, Shelley's got a new section right here. We've highlighted new sections in this with this blue splash. And as Karen alluded to it, this is a new section. So this is brand new. Again, this really talks about why it's important to fill out the pages and gems in the chronological order on the landing page. I think this year, that's a huge emphasis that our team is going to be making when working with districts, because as you, as Karen noted, the expenditures in CARES are moved over to this addressing fiscal health and safety. So whatever was self-reported in CARES ESER 1 expenditures is already being moved by GEMS to this report. And this report is new. And what it is doing is the US Department of Ed has asked for the category, how much did you spend on addressing health and safety? But really, where was the focus of that money? And, and what did that money support? So you'll see that there's different activities within that category. So the activities are A through G and A through G's sum must equal what you reported for expenditures in the CARES ESER 1 expenditure. And you'll see that we intentionally made these charts look different just so that it was a visual indication of where we are at and how to how to identify the type of, of financial data that you're providing to the US Department of Ed. So you can see here that CARES, Carissa, ARP are listed in three columns where in the prior, prior section of this um, report, they were listed individually and really thinking about each of those individual funding sources. Here, we are taking a more comprehensive look of potentially what did the district utilize for ESER funds across all three funding sources for cleaning and sanitation supplies. Okay, part two of section C is going to be focused on collecting information about hiring and retaining staff. And this is a new, new for this year. Um, the pages are going to look like this and you're going to be inserting staff under each of those four categories of addressing physical health and safety, students, uh, academic and social emotional needs and so forth. And then, so not only those four categories, but also those three different funds and it's it's the hiring of people. And then using that information, you're going to have to report what kinds of positions those supported. And you can see that the US Department of Ed is particularly concerned with how many special education, edu special education educators, I guess, and related service personnel were supported. And, and I'm gonna say those are teachers or therapists then paraprofessionals who will be the ed techs, 
then uh, ed techs for with with um, I would say with any kind of program it doesn't have to be a special education paraprofessional. If you hire someone who's a paraprofessional in another sitting, I think that's right, Shelley. Um, then bilingual and or English as a second language or teachers of English learners, school counselors. There, the U.S. Department of Ed is interested in including psychologists and social workers, nurses, nurses, short-term contractors, and then classroom educators. So you can see that they're putting, they're, they're asking for all, you know, all the others, the regular teachers or general ed classroom teachers, but they're down there at the bottom. Then support personnel, those uh, I would say are the custodians and uh, bus drivers and kitchen folks. Then administrative staff not covered by previous categories. And, and you can determine yourselves who, uh, you know, a person who's uh, employed, um, I don't know, as, as someone who might be uh, coordinating bus delivery, you know, bus bus time, uh, whether that's administrative or support. So the only table that is active for ent data entry is this bottom table where you see the numbers are in little text boxes. Again, Karen spoke about salaries and benefits and the need to separate them out in the ESER expenditure pages that we previewed earlier. And that information, both the salaries and the benefits for CARES, CARISA, ARP is going to be populated based on the information that you put in the three pages that related to the expenditures by funding source. So what happens is this top table is pre-populated you will have a sub grant total. So by funding source in all four categories, these are the totals that were populated by the district in, in the expenditure three pages above. And in totality, the 55,750 is what was spent of ESER funds in salaries and benefits through all four categories, all three funding sources. And essentially this dollar value down here must equate to the 55.7 that you reported in the first set of financial matters. This is only, this hiring and retention page is only for ESER funded positions, whether they are fully funded or partially funded. We're gonna get to another page that relates to any um, funding source and staff but this page, set part two, section C, is only related to ESER-funded staff. Okay. Teresa had a question uh, about where she would put a an instructional coach, I think was the term she used. And it, it, it's up to you to decide, um, you know, if that person's hired as a on a teacher's contract, I would say put them with classroom teacher, but you might also view them in your own mind or, you know, the district might view them as administrator. So however you want to do that, as long as you can defend it and then you have it hold that consistently through the reporting. And I know that the U.S. Department of Ed has received those questions over time as they're refining the reports over the performance reports after years. And this year in year four's ESER collection form, there's actually a supplement A that has definitions of these staff categories. So I would use this as a base and then again, maintain documentation to say that Shelly is an instructional coach and I coded them to this staff type so that when next year's performance report comes around, you can use that same method in which you've identified staff that over time and is consistent. Okay, part three. Okay, now we're focusing in deep on this, uh, how you spent the reservation fund, you know, the 20% or more that you set aside to address learning loss. And this is a new section. And you're going to have, uh, you're going to self-report the amount that you put in that reservation. Uh, excuse me, the, the self-reported part is going to be pre-populated from a previous uh, calculation. The total amount expanded for all interventions must match, <laughs> excuse me, the self-reported amount. And you can see the list of <laughs> all of the um, potential reservation projects in right in that form. 
and her uh, response to how the activities or interventions are supporting each of the underrepresented groups is also required this year. And again, this shouldn't be a surprise, but we're going to, the U.S. Department of Education is really interested in the numbers of groups that might have been um, more impacted by the uh, pandemic than others. Uh, it's like they're referring to them as underrepresented groups and looking for numbers for how how many participated and how many were eligible to, to participate. So that that is that's coming up in the next couple of slides are teasing out of that. Uh, but first it, we were asking some general information about how you use that reservation. And, and just to, notice if it if you select other, you're going to have to fill in something. And just a few other things that I wanted to note um, related to this information. The first line within the performance report is a calculation of all of your reservation projects from your ARP application. So this number, the top number, the 117, is pre-populated based on your ARP application, not anything within this performance report. The second number, the 19-2, is what is um, brought over from those previous expenditure pages. So again, it's critical to do the work in GEMS in the, in the chronological order that is on the landing page for all of these reasons. There is a logic and you will have an error if these columns, the, the sum of the amount expended does not equal the amount that you've previously reported on an expenditure page. This concept, this information may look familiar from last year, but last year there wasn't a dollar expenditure. It was just a yes or no. Is this an intervention that I used in my at the local level? Yes or no. And now the US Department of Ed is asking about how much is being spent for each of the interventions that you are utilizing at the local level. Again, this is just a slide to indicate that when we presented on FY22's performance report last year, we had the, a preview of what's coming and what is a new section for FY23's performance report. Okay, and so here we get to uh, details about participation. And this can be a little bit tricky with the yeses and nos. So I wanna make sure I say it clearly. Shelley will correct me if I do not. Um, the report is asking how the LEA used ESSER funds to support learning recovery. And there are different ways you could have done it. And you're just gonna say, yes, we did it or no, we didn't. Uh, mark yes or no to each activity. And if, it, if an activity was offered by the LEA, if it was offered, additional information will be requested. So for evidence-based summer learning, we said, you, you're, this report says, yes, we did. Uh, and then was it open to all students is the next question. And this one that we filled out as an example is no. Okay, so if it's not open to all 1,000 students K through pre-K through 12 in your district, then we're gonna to want to know how many students it was opened to. So by saying no, it opens up these other questions. And then uh, including uh, total unique headcount and number of students from each of the student groups who were eligible to participate. So here we're looking, again, they're digging down into who is this program open to, how many students of these categories of A through N, I think it is, um, students, low, low, students of low income, English learners, and so forth. So, and then you're going to be reporting on this for summer learning and enrichment. You're gonna report on this for after school programming, which was another uh, sort of preconceived uh, possible reservation activity. Three, extended learning and extended instructional time for high dose tutoring and five early childhood programming. So you're going to, again, have to say yes or no, we offered it, how many students it was offered to, and then students who were of these uh, categories of interest.
Well, I can answer Natasha's question. Yes, only if funded with ESSER funds. <laughs> so there's that. The Portland question was about uh, what if there were, uh, what if tutoring, what if one of these interventions was contracted out? And I, I think, Kate, the question is more about the time in which the high do dose tutoring was contracted. From, from my perspective, but again, the local level is gonna have to make this decision. To me, the intervention was high dose tutoring, not necessarily summer learning. But again, that's a determination that the district is going to have to make because it potentially could be summer learning, but was from a, from a tutoring company. So based on the information that you have, you will be able to determine if it is summer learning number one or number four high dose tutoring. This is a new section and a new page within the performance report. So this is part five and it's all about the demographics of the LEA. So you are going to determine what your student count is and that's going to be your unique headcount at the bottom. And this unique headcount will not be a sum of all of the columns um, here because we know that a student might have belong to multiple subgroups. So what you will do is you will determine your student enrollment, your unique headcount, and you will, de you will determine the student subgroups and the, the, the enrolled students of that student subgroup. Okay, and here's another set of yes and no. So uh, again, the US Department of Ed is interested in what the funds supported. Question will ask, did the SAU expend ESSER funds on items related to safe in-person instruction? Yes or no. Uh, I, I think these are similar to last year. Did uh, Were they used to provide home internet or to re-engage students with poor attendance? Um, note that you must respond to every question. And if you say they were, uh, you did something else with those funds, you need to specify exactly what it was like for, um, yes, for internet access. What, what else did you do there? So in the fine print, you can see, um, uh, there are some very specific activities, like for re-engaging students, was there direct outreach? Was there, um, let's see, engaging uh, the school and district homeless lesson uh, activities, like liaison? Those, those are things you're going to have to say yes or no to. And this is identical from last year. The only thing that is different is we put all three of these questions on one page. Last year, it was on multiple pages. It was on three different pages. The next section, the next part, which is part seven, allocation of ESA resources within the SAU. This is identical to last year. There is nothing new on this page. Essentially what it uh, is requesting for information is if you, if a district utilized funds specifically for one school within the district, how was it determined to use those funds for that particular school? You may, you'll see that there's a, a pre-populated list. There's also a uh, narrative box and there's also a, an other. So if you have an other method in which you determined the allocation to schools within the district, that is going to be uh, required information. Again, as you can see within ARP statute, Congress really felt it was important to be sure that these dollars were spent on learning loss with the students who are the greatest impacted by the, the pandemic. So all of these questions are really sort of aimed into how did you determine the need and how was that need addressed? Uh, not at this time. So um, John asked about equitable 
services for CARES ESER 1, and there is nothing in this performance report because we've already confirmed expenses for CARES before it closed out in September of 22. Okay, Whew. now we get to part eight. Um, and this is similar to last year. Um, so this this is not new. Uh, the report asks for FTE positions in the district. Uh, the amount of time per week spent on an activity divided by the amount of time per week normally considered as full time. Uh, please express the numbers here as decimals. And uh, these, these are positions that are going to be funded by this grant, but also state and local funding. So your general operating budget, as well as the any ESSER funds, uh, you're going to report the numbers of FTE positions that you had in your district for all of those dates. So what the federal government is looking for is information about, okay, how, how many staff were working before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and now? And please note that um, our first iteration of this um, software uh, you know, this this had to be built. This report had to be built. And the first iteration does not have 10-1-2023, but it will have 10-1-2023. So you'll notice that most of these align with the, the uh, October counts that, you know, we, we know you're already reporting. But the federal government is also particularly interested in what happened right at the start of the pandemic, which was what, March 15th, 2020. And we selected a date, we thought you were reporting on April 1st every year. Actually, you're not, at least not staff on April 1st, but we picked April 1st as that time when you, um, if you had any changes and we're hoping that you didn't because uh, you know uh, educators were essential employees, at the start of the pandemic, but if, if there were any changes, um, that's a place to report that for 4-1-2020. So most of you did this last year, so I think this can be pretty straightforward and we're just gonna be asking now for uh, new information, 10-1-2023. Look for that in the revised version of this. So Karen, I'm, I'll take 27 and 28, just because I okay. have a few of these preview slides. Um, so FY22's performance report indicated that we would be asking more granular data when it related to FTEs. So that was the preview slide from last year. And this section is new, as we indicated in our last year's preview. And what it is requesting for information is by school, how many FTEs by staff type? So you will provide the FTE by staff by school. You can see that there's four particular areas and roles that the US Department of Ed has requested we obtain information from our LEAs. We have asked GEMS to pre-populate the schools within your LEA because we have that information. So this list on the left-hand side of your schools within the LEA will be pre-populated and these text box within these rows and columns will be where you will indicate the FTE count. Again, thinking about if one full-time nurse serves all of these schools within the district, how would you allocate their time between each of the schools? You may select to take one FTE divided by the number of schools. Uh, I think the example here on the right-hand side says five schools, which is allocating 0.2 FTEs to each school served. So remembering that this is all self-reported, this is not information that we have um, in-house you want to be sure that you're documenting so that you can be consistent over time. Again, these roles were defined in supplemental um, item A of the year four US Department of Ed collection data form. We are at part nine. So part nine is planned uses. 
This area is identical to last year. So what will happen is your allocation will be pre-populated. Your expenses prior to FY23 are pre-populated. We know your FY23 expenses because we, we will pre-populate that in the expenditures reports for you to use as a total. And this is a, a typo in the system. We're gonna get that fixed as well. Um, but this bottom line is going to be the dollars per funding source that are at the table on July 1st of 2023, which is the end of FY23, the start of FY24. And essentially the US Department of Ed would like to know of that $15,000 that you have remaining in CARES, what is your planned use out of these four uh, categories? Each column in this chart, which is where you will enter your planned uses must equal a hundred. So again, making sure that you utilize the information that's pre-populated to determine what activities you have left and what categories they, they live in. Okay, and um, we part five, uh, excuse me, part 10 asks for those two plans that ARP requires you to have on your website during the duration of ARP. Now we don't report this data directly to the US Department of Education in our performance report, but we report it in a separate document. Um, we have to send them or we have sent them a copy of the URLs, the precise URLs that bring them direct, whoever is interested, bring them directly to the report on the SAU page that says, first of all, the first one is which, uh, how, how, um, the safe return plan, you know, are you in session? What are the rules, what are the protocols around uh, COVID at this time? Are you hybrid or in-person? And we, we know most folks are in-person at this time and, and it may seem like everyone knows that we've been in-person for a year or two years. The uh, plan still needs to be on the website and it needs to be updated at least every six months. And we ask you to document the date when you as a school committee or board uh, and um, said, yes, this is our plan and we're continuing it into the next six months. You know, we're gonna be, let's say in person. So we're gonna be looking for that. Uh, <coughs> we ask you for the date, I believe, and, um, any, and the date it was reviewed or revised. And then we also ask for the URL for the publicly available plan for how you're using the funds. Now this becomes important because I know right now that a number of folks are revising their applications. Maybe they're adding a new project or maybe they've cut down significantly in, an, in another project. Um, the, the outline of how you're using the funds for ARP should be on your website, it needs to be on your website and it needs to accurately reflect what, what is in your application. You don't have to have all of the details, but you need to have all of the you know, general projects listed. Um, yeah, so they need to be continually available and through the end of the grant, which is next September, the end of September, 2024. Uh, and we have uh, on our website and for all to see, whether it's your local folks in your community, whether it's leg local legislators or the US Department of Education, they may be very well interested in looking to see what your plan for the use of ESSER funds is. And they wanna make sure that those links, we wanna make sure that the URLs are accurate. Um, and something new that we're asking about too, and this is at the request of the US Department of Education, they wanna make sure you may already have this, but there should be a statement about fraud, waste and abuse. Um, uh, because our U.S. Department of Education wants to know that. Um, so you should have a page on your website for where people can, if someone in your community thinks there's been uh, fraudulent expenditures or abuse of the funds, of, of any federal funds, uh, they know where they can go to report that. That should be on your website, and we're going to be asking you to supply us with the URL for that um, information. 
And that came through uh, federal monitoring out of the main DOE for all of our federal programs. And that brings us to the very last part in the performance report, which is part 11 is related to Davis-Bacon. Essentially what this page is asking is if you had any minor remodeling, revisions, repairs, or con construction contracts over $2,000 that you are aware and you are certifying that you are providing prevailing wage requirements. So this has been something that we have discussed very frequently with districts who have acquired new space or tried to renovate or do large construction projects with the emergency relief funding. But Davis-Bacon applies to even the contracted service provider who came in and rewired for uh, HVAC systems in the early onset of the pandemic. So again, thinking about your contracts and if there was anything that was over $2,000, they must, the district must attest that they are providing Davis wages, Davis Bacon wages, but they're also maintaining all of the requirements that come along with the prevailing wage. This, and as I said, that's that's the last part within the performance report. So once everything has been completed and each page has a check mark to the left on the landing page, you can toggle over to the submission within the blue bar. You will enter in your username and password and you will submit it for review. That will generate the email that we spoke about early on that will go directly to your superintendent. Your superintendent will review and certify that the, act, the information is accurate. And then that will be deposited into our GEMS portal for review. I know that we've used most of the time to talk about the uh, report itself. I think our team has done a wonderful job monitoring the questions in the chat box, but we do have a few minutes if there's any last minute questions.